presentation this morning. And I'm happy that uh, apparently everybody made its way here. Uh, Germany is hit by a lot of strikes, but uh, I suppose that most of you did not between the strike of the trains and the strike of the aircrafts that helped you. Uh, some of our colleagues who are due to, to come back to Brussels uh, to start their working week uh, will be stuck somewhere and we expect them as of Wednesday. <laughs> Bavaria is very happy to host this important event. Media politics are of utmost importance for us. In the German system of competences, it's not the federal government which is responsible for that area. Um, the German lender are taking care of it and Bavaria is representing all German lender in the Council of Europe when it comes to media politics. Given that, I would like to express our sincere gratitude uh, to the European Audiovisual Visual Observatory, to, to you, Director Nikolchev, for the initiative to come here with today's workshop, and to Alison Hind, Hind, Hindhoff <laughs> for the excellent cooperation in preparing it. I just referred to the competences of the German Lender for Media Politics. However, as some of you know, the German, German system of competences is more complicated than that. Tax issues fall within the federal competences, and so does the issue of your debate today. But at the same time, decisions of our federal government, like fiscal incentive schemes for film industry, are very relevant for us, since Bavaria is among the most important locations for film productions in Germany. That is why we are also carefully observing uh, the ongoing negotiations about TTIP and notably its scope of application. And we insist on the exclusion of media from the no negotiation mandate uh, to be seen in a broad perspective. If the promotion of audiovisual production is not part of the negotiations, that means in our view that also fiscal incentives are not part of the negotiations. But now I'm handing the floor to you, Ms. Nikolchev, and I wish you well for today's discussion. Thank you very much. Lieber Herr Wiegand, dear friends of the observatory, if I may say so, First of all, thank you for all being here, despite the problems that were already mentioned. And a special thanks on our side for really to the Bavarian hosts. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to organize this meeting. We do that quite often. I don't think we have ever had such an easy task. So I recommend this to all of you who might have an interest, even so that might mean that in the future, if we were to come back, we might not get a spot. But thank you, Sin sincere thanks. Now, even so, I say, uh, I believe that most of you know the observatory, I still feel it might be good if I say a couple of, of words as to who we are and what we do. Now, the observatory is a part of the Council of Europe and it's based in Strasbourg, which is why also one of our colleagues cannot be here at the moment, it's difficult to travel. But if you find the time to travel, come and see us. Now we have 41 members at the observatory and that means almost all of the states in Europe plus the European Union plus, since this year, Morocco. What's our task? Our task is to help enhance transparency of the audiovisual sector in Europe and that we do by collecting data and information on the legal framework of the sector and its markets, as well as on sources for financing the sector. The way we do that is under one very, very strict premise, and that is that we'll be neutral. Neutral, no policy making, and really strictly down to collecting facts and information. Now, what sort of information can you therefore obtain from the observatory? I can give you only some examples. The list is much longer. Now we draw a detailed picture of the television, on-demand and film markets in our yearbook. We inform you about the latest relevant laws through our legal newsletter IRIS. You can also find lots of explanation in our publications of the EU regulatory and policy framework, 
that of the Council of Europe as well. We offer data of box offices, success of films via our Lumia database. And to get already a bit closer to the topic of today, we also inform you about national direct funding mechanisms through our quarter database and other in-depth reports. And I could continue that list. Now, then to really fit this into the context um, of today, why this conference? Now, fiscal incentives are a major source for the financing of the sector and therefore naturally a topic on which we should provide information. Now this conference, I have to say, is our first major step in do doing so more regularly in the future. It is at the same time our first event here in Brussels and the plan is really to be back next year with another interesting topic. So you may already know that for fall of next year. Now the study on which we focus today has been made possible thanks to a donation from the Ministry of uh, Education and Culture of Finland. I'm very pleased, therefore, to give a special welcome to Lena Larksonen, sitting here in front, who represents Finland on the Observatory's Governing Board and is, a, is the Councillor for Cultural Affairs and Acting Director of the Ministry. Thank you, Lena, and thank you, Finland. with the money. We used the donation to commission an impact analysis of fiscal incentive schemes intended to support film and audiovisual production in Europe. And today you will hear the preliminary results. The full report, including translations into German and French, will be available by the end of the year. The translations may be at the beginning of next year, depending on how quickly translators can work and how quickly we can control what they did. Now, a word on how we launched the study. We followed the procedures of the Council of Europe. We launched a tender, and it was won by Allsberg SPI, which is one of Europe's most experienced screen sector management consultancies with clients in the public and private sectors. Now, Jonathan, if I may permit myself to say so, the head of this consultancy um, has had a career first as a merchant banker in London and New York, has been in the film industry for more than 32 years in a variety of roles, producer, distributor, sales agent, management consultant, and you will hear more of him and his colleague, Andre Barnes, who is also with us, later in the day. Now, we did really enjoy working with Jonathan and his team and are looking forward to what they have to present. And before I let them do so, I would like still to stress what the role of the observatory was in the shaping of the study. We did really discuss, of course, and, and gave our parameters for the scope. We have tried to give advice as much as we could along the process. We supplied additional information and also contacts, and we gave regular feedbacks on the project at various stages. But what you also should know is what we have not done. We, have, we did not dictate how they should conduct the study. And we also did not and we will not interfere with the findings of the study. This, in our view, is the responsibility of the consultants. And any conclusions that are to be drawn are to be drawn by them or by you, by the people who use the information, be it from today or in the report. The observatory will not interfere here. We don't tell anybody what to do or not to do because of our strict commitment to neutrality. There's one exception to this rule that we won't interfere. We will interfere in pointing out where it's really at the core of our mission, where it's about transparency. And I think one thing that the study revealed is that there is still a lot of work to be done for us, maybe for others, to achieve a greater transparency when it comes to fiscal incentives, how they work, what impact they have, and, well, if we can help to further elaborate that, we will certainly do. Now, I also think um, you need to know a little bit more about the brief that we gave to Jonathan. 
as to what he should not cover, because that's what you will not hear now in his study. So we told him to leave out all the main measures for film public policy in support of film production and distribution, all the others. And on the European level, we would count as such support to European co-productions, your march, for example, support to European circulation, media, promotion of European works, the Artificial Media Service Directive. And on the national level, there are, in addition to fiscal incentives, direct funding, being state and territorial budgets, lottery, or levy on revenues of podcasters and distributors to finance national film funds, mandatory investments in production by broadcasters and distributors, co-production policies. So, this is all what you will not hear. The report to come, and now also the presentation to come, is really focusing only on tax shelter, tax credit, and rebates. The round table that will follow that discussion might then also go a bit wider as putting it into the context, but this will be the duty of my dear colleague Andre Lange, who will moderate um, the panel. Now, for all the other issues that I mentioned are also important to um, financing production, you might have a look at our website. Now, last but not least, I was asked to give you some uh, rules as to the help housekeeping. For those of you who are fans of tweeting, you can do so if you use the line that I will not really read because it looks very strange. If you manage to hook up to the Wi-Fi network as a user with the right password, which is Bavaria. That being said, I'm happy to hand over to Jonathan. Thank you, Suzanne, um, and thank you to the observatory for the opportunity for Andrew Barnes and I to be here today to um, give you our, uh, the findings of our study. And thank you also to the um, representation of the Free State of Bavaria to the EU um, for letting us have this terrific facility. I've spoken around Europe several times in meetings like this, and I think this now sets the gold standard for how um, this needs to be organized and presented in the future. So, what, what are we going to do? Um, Andrew and I are going to spend about, 20, about 40 minutes um, going through uh, the results, uh, the findings of the study that we've undertaken. Um, and essentially, after this introduction, there are five, if you like, five elements um, to, to what we're presenting to you, to our findings. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the categories of fiscal incentives that we've looked into because they've they got some interesting some elements uh, amongst them. We're then going to identify some of the trends that we've noticed in recent years as to what's going on. It's a very active sector, as you, as you all know, and so spotting what's happening and trying to um, determine what might happen in the future is part of our work. We're going to look specifically at um, the economic impacts um, of the incentives that we're studying. Um, having done that, we're going to sit back a little and think of, well, if we've now looked at what the categories and the trends are and the economic impacts are, what do we make of all of this? So we'll talk about some perspectives that we have on the, on the sort of the landscape of incentives around Europe, and then we're going to um, play back to you our sort of final so that's what um, that's what we'll be doing today. Okay, um, we're summarising the findings of the study so far. Um, there's a little bit more time to go, so if um, if anybody has any thoughts or comments, wants to spend time with us later today or communicate with us over the next week or, or so, we're still open to business as as you were as you as you were, but we don't expect much to change. Um, so let's talk about what we mean by fiscal incentives. Um, these are national measures and the amount of support and the way in which support is provided, generally speaking, is, is based on two different ways to go. Um, one is the 
um, amount of qualifying production expenditures of the run of the project, or alternatively, um, looking not at the project necessarily initially, looking at the investors who are coming into a project, the amount and the way in which their investment is structured, which determines the amount of support. So just to re repeat um, what Suzanne said earlier, we are not addressing national or regional discretionary or selective funding in, um, in this particular study. Um, although the most of the schemes we looked at cover both film and television um, production, and indeed in some cases, as we'll describe, a couple of other areas, um, most of the data we were able to get from the countries that we studied, and we'll explain what, who they are later, which they are, um, most of the data was about their feature film schemes. But we did uh, look at the impact of, of these incentives on film and, and also on television when, when we could. Um, something to say which will be a theme throughout our presentation is that, as you would expect, um, and as certainly as the observatory knows, um, the quantitative data that we were seeking um, was not always fully complete or up to date. <coughs> it wasn't presented necessarily in the same way country by country. So the comparisons were a bit of a challenge. Um, we spent a lot of time working with the countries that we studied who were very, very helpful and we thank them all for their cooperation. So we spent a lot of time looking at data, going back to our sources, <coughs> excuse me, um, making sure we, it was complete, that we were interpreting it in the right way. Um, but as a consequence of this, and I think you can imagine if you're looking to try and get um, data from all of Europe that was the same from country to country, you can imagine the challenge. As a consequence of this, our research methodology always had as a very important element of it qualitative research. So that involved not just <coughs> literature reviews, desk research on whatever we could find from reports from the countries concerned, and elsewhere, but also a substantial number of individual interviews, confidential consultations as, as we call them, with um, key professionals and players around Europe um, and in the countries that, um, that, uh, that we were studying. And in some cases, we were very grateful that our consultees were willing to talk to us on several occasions. I mean, we probably so far conducted over 80 consultations um, at this point, and um, we probably have a few more to go. Okay, I'm going to talk now, uh, just to dig a little bit deeper into the categorization of the, of the fiscal incentives that we studied. Um, and they, there are three categories. Um, the, we call them tax shelters, rebates, and tax credits. Um, and let me try and be clear as to what the differences are. Tax shelters, um, these are the sort of incentives that um, is where Europe started, if, if you like. Um, this was, um, a, the, these are structures that essentially um, invite uh, tax-paying individuals or companies, usually with substantial tax liabilities, to invest in production, qualifying production, and if they were to invest in production, they get attractive write-offs, essentially deductions against those tax liabilities. Um, as such, um, these schemes, it's, it's interesting, it's, it's quite hard to identify in countries that have these schemes or have had these schemes exactly how much um, from a, a national budget, for example, is being, um, how much money is supporting production in this way. Um, also, uh, although initially um, the, the national treasury concern is losing revenue because there's a, they're sheltering the liabilities, there is sort of downstream taxable um, occurrences that the treasury will get back some of the money. If the, tax, uh, if the investors get profits, they're taxed on those profits, and also the activity that's generated in production yields tax returns. So you can measure, you can measure a cost-benefit analysis, but one of the advantages of this, of this system, in some cases to governments, has been it's not, you can't always tell what it's costing a nation. So it's, it's less than 100% transparency you get in the next two. Rebates, the second of these systems, um, much simpler, um, essentially constructed in a way 
that there are a set of rules and regulations that a produ qualifying production must adhere to in order to identify the amount of qualifying expenditure on which the rebate, which is essentially a percentage, expressed as a percentage of, of that amount, um, comes back um, to the production company. Um, I think, uh, I suppose one would say this, this is a, a trend one would see uh, more and more of this sort of simpler style of rebate. The, it is, however, quite obvious in, in, a, in a budget of a national ministry, often the Ministry of Culture, what the amount of money being spent each year is, and in some cases there are, um, there are caps or, or um, maximum amounts in any year which are available, which can create some problems. The third category that we've identified, tax credits, are essentially very, very similar to rebates, but um, the way in which the producer actually gets access to the rebate uh, is through their annual tax return. As a consequence, um, if a company that is seeking to get the rebate through this measure has substantial tax liabilities, they will not get the full benefit of the rebate because one is, is set against the other. Okay. Just to identify um, some of the countries in Europe that have the most active structures, I mean, this isn't um, a complete list, but uh, th these, you know, we see these as countries that um, one could have stu studied. Um, and it's quite interesting that Lithuania, a recent um, entity, has decided to go this route. Um, in the case of France and, and the Sofikas, they've been around probably longer than any other structure. And as you'll be seeing in our presentation, France has a very sophisticated um, system of support measures of, of this type, of which one um, is, is the software. The countries that um, currently are operating rebates are shown here. Um, and again, countries that have recently become involved, like Croatia, has decided to go this route. Um, and Netherlands, which um, has recently recreated an incentive, used to have, I think I'm right in saying, a tax shelter many years ago, stopped it, and now has come back with a, a more sort of typical rebate structure. And the tax credit that um, I mentioned before, um, again, France has had a very substantial, um, which my colleague Andrew described in, in a while, a series of support mechanisms along these lines that uh, work very, very well. Um, Italy and its grouping of different types of structures also has in the UK moved away in 2006-07 from a tax shelter structure to a tax credit structure with substantial success. Okay, let's talk about some trends. Um, first of all, um, there's a lot of activity. Um, many countries around Europe have uh, introduced, or several countries have introduced new incentives and several of the countries that have existing incentives have adapted or modernized or updated what they already have. Um, so, some examples here of where incentives um, already exist or have been recently introduced. Um, the, you know, within the last year or so, all of these countries have, um, have introduced new, new measures. Um, do you want to just mention what's happened in Serbia? Yeah, so pre uh, Serbia previously had an incentive uh, between 2011 and 2012 as a single year trial and they have recently suggested they will reintroduce this but it was previously um, removed because of the lack of broader support around the industry they, they required some leading changes to really maximise the impact which uh, so we, we thought it's interesting to look at Serbia because these sorts of fiscal incentives are not, you know, they're not that obvious how they work. Um, when they're introduced in some countries, they're not always introduced with great clarity. And in, in, other, in some countries, even after introduction, it's not certain as to what the results are and what the movement is. So I think later on um, in our panel, we might talk about how we can improve the the data and the communications aspects of, of the incentives work. Very interesting at the moment that one region in Europe that hasn't had incentives is the Nordic countries, except for Iceland, I have to say. Um, and there seems to be at the moment a lot of discussion within several of the countries um, about introducing uh, an incentive. In, in many of these countries, they're 
the film agreement is being renegotiated. These are sort of support agreements that last for several years. And in, in Sweden, for example, in Finland, um, this negotiation about film agreements is um, uh, incentives is a key aspect of it. Um, and also in Norway, I think um, I'm right in saying that um, there was talk about an incentive several years ago, and one was announced, and um, it didn't happen. And uh, we can talk about it later on about why not, but essentially, it was my, my take on it is it didn't happen because it wasn't made clear to the production community what the advantages would be. Now Norway is, is what's more um, having a look at it again. I mentioned earlier that um, some schemes um, coming from the ministry's budget have limitations or caps, um, which restrict the amount of funding available. Um, but in some countries, like the Czech Republic, for example, and others, these caps are being increased. We haven't seen any instant of a cap being decreased, I think it's fair to say. Um, and in, indeed, adjustments are being made, for example, in Ireland, um, where the proportion of the percentage, if you like, of the expenditure, qualifying expenditure, is being increased. Um, and in the UK and in Italy in recent years, the schemes have been expanded from um, feature films to cover television, and indeed in the UK, animation and video games. Um, a movement away from the tax shelter model. Why is this the case? Um, it's, as I said earlier, uh, the tax shelter structure is complicated. It's between the money coming from the investor landing in the production um, funding account. There are several steps that have to be taken. Um, several entities like um, certainly lawyers, accountants, bankers, and in general, the feeling has been with most of these systems that they're not sufficiently transparent, and I'm not addressing any particular nation's structure right now, but transparency has been hard, and it's been regarded as actually being um, quite expensive um, because of all these uh, deductions that happen along the way. Um, do you want to talk about Belgium for a moment? I think <clears throat> so. Belgium, the Belgian federal parliament has recently adopted various reforms. So far as we're aware, uh, when we've last spoken to people in the Belgian community, they are, there's a discussion with the European Commission for State Aid certification. Um, we're expecting, or they're expecting a, uh, those to be finalised for next year. But the, the Belgian system has been one of the most impressive and successful, and I think we'll, we'll show some information about that a little bit later on. But next door in, in Luxembourg, um, their tax shelter incentive structure has recently been closed. Um, we are not informed as to why, to be honest. We've tried to find out. There, there's even some confusion. There are some sort of national um, film support, uh, film industry websites that still claim the incentive is still there, but our information is that, that it's been closed and it, it's going to be um, re replaced with more direct funding, as, as far as we understand. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, from a producer's perspective, um, they have, um, in some cases, complained or, or commented that managing the relationship and communications with investors and all these entities, the banks, the lawyers, the accountants, um, is compared to a, a rebate or a tax credit structure, very time consuming um, and can cause delays, um, which for them is a problem. However, um, a, sh a tax shelter has one very substantial advantage, and that it, it does provide the cash um, from the incentive during the production process. Um, most of the other structures, um, by and large, rebate or return the money spent you know, after the production has been completed or after an accountant's <coughs> certificate has been supplied. Um, Although there are some systems um, that, even if they are rebates or tax credits, that do have a process for um, providing interim certificates uh, from the competent authority that does um, provide the producer an opportunity to get some cash flow. Yeah, I'm an interesting <coughs> example of this. Uh, within the framework of the new tax rebate structure that they're adopting, they will be um, allowed up to 90% money up front, providing the productions meet certain criteria that I think they're just finalising at the moment. So you can see the, there is no one-size-fits-all um, system um, and 
I mean, that's not a surprise, obviously, because all these countries are, are very different. But the, if you like, the technology behind structuring incentives is changing and developing all the time, which makes it a very, very interesting um, area to look at. Okay, um, one of the concerns that um, we have found um, is that in countries that are thinking about new incentive structures, um, there are some producers in some countries um, are worried that the additional money made available for the incentive will actually be deducted from other sources of support, such as uh, discretionary funding. Um, and again, back to Norway, this was one of the reasons why um, uh, the first time Norway tried to put an incentive in place, it wasn't enacted. Um, the reality is, we've looked around for evidence um, that such cuts normally follow um, when an incentive is introduced or improved, and it's very, very hard to find. Possibly Italy's an example. Yeah, Italy, um, there, is, there has been some evidence that, uh, that direct funding, discretionary funding has been cut, but it's very difficult to unknit that from the broader governmental challenges and fiscal challenges the country is facing. Overall, the investment in the industry has gone up, and that obviously re reflects the importance the Italian government sort of states for the industry. Okay. Something to, to mention about the rebate style incentives that, again, is, is not necessarily always recognised. And this applies to a country that perhaps can create additional production activity um, as a result of the incentive being in place. Um, because of the timing of the repayment of the rebate, usually being um, after the production expenditure has incurred, for additional activity, the tax yield and the multiplier economic yield to the treasury of having the additional new production is often sufficient to actually fund the rebate when it occurs many months later. So in, in some cases, um, these new schemes, or indeed existing schemes are very improved, um, can be considered to be self-financing. So when, when there are concerns that um, within a government that well, we're making this money available um, for a new incentive and that's going to drain the coffers of the treasury, it's not necessarily at all always the case because of this, this sort of timing of the cash flows. However, um, there is no doubt that in some territories, some countries that have particularly high um, costs of production and have no incentive, um, Norway, Finland, Sweden, we're looking at you in this regard. Um, sorry. Um, the, there's definite exposure to um, lower cost neighbours in the Baltic territories. We've got lots of examples of this that do have incentives. So lower cost and an incentive against higher cost and no incentive is a very difficult uh, market in which to operate. Okay, Andrew. Okay, so if we move on to how we did the economic impact study. The methodology we used was something called difference in differences. We looked at a baseline of countries which had incentives, particularly useful those which have changed or improved them over the period, although there are limited numbers of those with enough data. Um, and we compared those against countries which didn't. You can create a baseline of, uh, of production spend, production trends within Europe, and look at what the impact of the incentive is as part of this. This gives us a, a, a way of looking at it in broader than just a single country. Um, obviously, there's a lot of factors which affect production spend. The needs of a particular uh, script being uh, the, the smallest one of them, you know, people aren't going to shoot Lawrence of Arabia in Switzerland. And there's a lot of things around that which have been adjusted um, using qualitative data into the um, economic, econometric analysis that we've undertaken. We looked at a, a sample of, of production country uh, support systems based on whether or not they had a fiscal incentive system, the depth and compatibility of, of available data, which is a, a key challenge. We have, everyone looks at their systems very differently depending on national preferences. We have to be able to get everything into a, system, into a position where the data are comparable. And as a result, we came up with this list of countries. Um, a few comments, obviously, in France, in Italy, in the United Kingdom, in various countries, there's multiple bits of legislation that underpin the different incentive systems. There are four different petits d'impôts in France. 
um, there are four, three, four different tax uh, relief structures in the UK which underpin it, but for the purpose of simplicity we've just done it in this regard. There's also a lot more legislation dates than we perhaps noted on here. These are the major ones where they've gone back to the Commission for the purposes of recertification, which are obviously the, uh, the major sort of dates that we're looking at. And we've compared them to a number of countries which don't have incentives. We came down to these three in the end based on the availability and depth of data, which allow us to look at broader scale production trends within the European um, space. This is a graph that we borrowed from the, uh, from the CNC's recent report, which was very useful, showing the amount of annual investment through the tax shelter. It's in millions of euros, there's no inflation adjustment, but it does show that there's a really strong trend in the amount that is going in through the tax shelter, both in loans and uh, in equity, since 2003, and there's a really strong, steady and consistent growth in the amount that goes through Belgian productions. Croatia is obviously an interesting country, one of the recent um, joiners to the European fiscal incentive landscape, and it, used, it gives us some really useful data on the effect. And if we look at where we were before the incentive, the red line, and since the launch of the incentive is the little orange line, and if we sort of continued it for 2014, it would be somewhere up there. It keeps going up, Sandy can talk about more, more about that lunch when we go through the panel. But also if you look at the level of discretionary funding, that stayed relatively in the same range. Um, there is no project which has received both to date, um, and there's a lot of new production activity and a lot of extra investment coming into the industry as a result of the introduction of the, uh, the remit. Capacity utilization is a really important measure of this. When we look at the data, what we can see is that the introduction of incentive has a, frequently has a really immediate catalytic impact on the scale. Capacity that is unused or that is, is perhaps a bit redundant uh, where there is no incentive, where it's based on selective funding or private funding, gets very quickly used up and capacity that is easily created, people coming from other comparable sectors, TV production, or sort of national level TV production, theatre, move into the sector and are able to sort of upskill and invest. The, the result is that the, the state reaches its, you know, reaches its capacity utilisation in a much shorter period of time than would be the case if just private investment, if just um, you know, the status quo continued. And where the incentive continues for a long period, that sustains the growth, it underpins it, and it builds confidence for further investment in the industry. We can see in, in multiple countries that investment in facilities is very much underpinned, if you, if you speak to people, by their knowledge that an incentive is there and it's going to stick around for a while in an unchanged form. So as a result, the incentives help to underpin the essential investment in skills and infrastructure capacity, delivering a long-term sectoral health so that even where a lot of the incentive is used for, for investment production, for portable productions coming from overseas, the, um, the underpinning of the skills and the infrastructure capacity that is generated is incredibly useful for the local industry. And if we look at the growth that we can see in three countries, we've got the Czech, uh, Croatia here again, and we've got the UK in blue, which is um, almost doubled since the introduction of the current tax into, uh, relief in uh, 2007. France is on a slightly steadier track, but obviously, as we know, France has got a lot more incentives, and this is the introduction of the Crédit d'Emploi de National, the trip. Um, but overall, what we can see is if we compare countries with an incentive, countries without, and the graph was unfortunately far too complicated to put up here, then the, the track for countries with an incentive is very immediate and very quick upwards. If we look at the data of countries with and without incentives, there's also significantly higher production activities in those countries. There's obviously a variety of factors within this, as we've mentioned earlier, the, the needs of the script, the needs of the creative side of the film, of, of drive the initial decision to move to a particular location. But the incentives are a major contributing factor. And if we look at countries with incentives in blue, um, against the countries that we've chosen without incentives, 
the percentage of GDP, the percentage of the economy to which the film industry and TV industry contributes is much higher, particularly in countries like Hungary, the UK and Belgium with long-term stable incentive structures which are very predictable and understandable for producers coming in. Sector growth is also strongest in countries with incentives or, and this is also very important, where selective funding was increased. If we look at the graph, Croatia is, is a bit of an anomaly because of the time scale. If we did this again for next year, it would, it would be above the line and would have positive growth. These same countries, the UK, Hungary and Belgium, have the strongest growth over the period. Poland um, increased its uh, selective funding, so that's put out there. The Netherlands um, is a slightly unusual case. There's been a lot of increased um, private sector funding and broadcast funding of films, largely from speaking to people on account of the fact that, that uh, box office for local productions has, has increased quite markedly in recent years, and that's sort of helped drive more investment in. Finland, um, as we talked about, countries which unfortunately are faced with, um, with neighbours with lower cost bases and incentives, has, um, has seen quite a precipitous drop in the last four years. The countries, not everyone publishes the fiscal benefits of this incentive, which is slightly unfortunate, but those that do, do show large positive impacts. Um, these, are, these are a selection of published ones, and if we look at the recent report for France, for every euro of investment that comes into the country, you get 12.8 euros of investment in the sector and 3.5 euros of tax. That's from the CNC's recent reports. Um, Hungary and Ireland both show um, positives, so 20, uh, 24.2 percent more tax paid than was uh, than was deferred through the tax shelter. Um, and for Ireland, the uh, Department of Finance's cost-benefit model puts the net tax benefits at 21.1 million euros. The UK has similar figures to France, 12 British pounds in additional GVA, that's sectoral equivalent to GDP, generated for every pound of tax relief spent. And right, I think we're going to run over time a little bit, but you can give me the other one. Stop that signal when we do. Okay, sorry. Right, in many countries, measuring levels of employment is um, a very helpful and potent um, in indicator of success. Um, but unfortunately, um, although many countries do track employment, the, um, there's, not, there's rarely a clear and consistent methodology used to quantify new jobs created, either full-time or full-time equivalents. Um, there, it's interesting that some of the incentive schemes um, that we've studied um, require and mandate that any production uh, which seeks to benefit from the use of, of the scheme is, uh, must supply uh, employment data, and, and certainly that's been very, very helpful. Um, but our qualitative um, investigations shows unequivocally that um, strong incentive structures, when they're introduced and when they're supported and, and are you know, confidently maintained, are, um, they do drive um, a solid increase in crew numbers. There's a lag between the introduction of an incentive and that crew growing, and we'll come on to that um, in a while. But there are examples of countries where, where we've seen this, and just because a country isn't mentioned, it doesn't mean to say that um, that this is not the case. The, the, the report that will be commented on later, I think, has a, some excellent uh, data about this, as uh, has got a recent report from Deloitte about Belgium. This, this is a very interesting uh, factor, and I think it's, it's totally understandable, but um, adjacent nations or, or film sectors and countries that are close or next to each other of, there's strong evidence of the mobility of labour across the border. Um, so we'll show this a bit later with regard to Czech Republic and Hungary. It's definitely been the case for a while in, with France and Belgium or UK and Ireland. Um, the, the whole co-production system helps this, of course. Um, there's no doubt, however, that fluctuations in incentives, um, and we'll study this again between the Czech Republic and Hungary, and while it does affect job opportunities, which 
causes the, the mobility of labour. The UK, which has had an incentive structure for quite a, quite a long time, um, has seen much greater stability in its crew numbers. And indeed, even in recent years, um, there's been substantial, um, well, considerable strength in, in growth. Um, right. Obviously, data year on year will change and will be different for a, a variety of, of reasons in all the countries that we studied. Um, however, I think it's, it's true to say that Hungary and the Czech Republic, of all the markets that we studied, tend to almost operate as a, as a single, well, single labour market, but also uh, approaching being a single market with other issues um, or other elements, such as um, facilities. Um, equipment supply, um, even financiers that uh, uh, producers that, that work across both. And this graph um, shows, where's that smart pen? Here it is. Um, so, you know, this, this shows how there's a the trend in growth um, of sector spending, which is production expenditure, I think, yes. that we've studied. Um, it's a very even sort of collaborative uh, growth Structure, particularly since <coughs> 2011, um, which I think if we do, if we analyse some other countries as well, we would probably see uh, repeated um, infrastructure investment. And we think is a very important theme to our study. We've already talked about um, how the introduction or improvement of an incentive has an almost immediate catalytic effect on sucking up whatever available capacity that might exist. So that's. That's, that obviously includes um, crew um, and film workers or screen workers, but it also <coughs> applies to the infrastructure, the, the supply of facilities and equipment and what have you. And our qualitative research has shown that over a period of time, very substantial investment has followed um, uh, successful schemes. Um, and I think Hungary, we, we've noticed not just the Porter Studios, but since the Hungarian um, incentive was introduced and has been successful, um, there have been lots of, um, lots of discussion and thoughts about um, studio expansion. But in the UK in particular, um, the stability of the tax reform has led to very substantial private sector investment in studios and other facilities, over half a million um, since 2007, we are told. Um, Another challenge for us in terms of data is figuring out um, how much of the increased activity comes from foreign investment both outside of the country concern but outside of Europe. Um, and this is an area where we would like to suggest in the future it is one of the areas where um, some more work is done in terms of transparency and what have you. However, um, the, our consultations were very helpful in, in helping us get a sense of what was happening. And m much of the growth, if not most of the growth that we've seen in production activity has come from outside of the nation concern and mostly outside of Europe. Um, so what's been happening with all of this um, increased activity is, particularly if the support mechanism incentives is regarded as being stable and can be there for a while, creates confidence, capacity is immediately um, uh, used up and then eventually planning for more capacity and, and crew improvement uh, takes place. So what does this mean for the local independent producer that's not involved necessarily in the international portable production business? Well there are advantages. Obviously the, the fact that the overall, so the overall sector infrastructure and crew standards are increasing um, will help independent producers when they're able to and when they do um, use those facilities. Um, and I think, if you move on, yeah, that, uh, this is something that we noticed in that, remember that Hungary, uh, the Hungary Czech Republic slide that we showed before, the Croatia slide, there's lots of evidence in, in those countries, um, both experiencing relatively recent incentives, that, um, that this is a factor, but also, um, the independent producers in other countries which have had incentives for a while, UK, Belgium, um, Ireland, um, etc., have noticed this. 
Um, what's been happening is, in addition to their established business of independent um, production, uh, development and production, many producers have taken advantage of this increased business to, exp to, to get involved in or expand their existing activities in service production. Um, and also in countries we've noticed that have introduced television drama as part of the support mechanism for the tax uh, relief, um, we've noticed feature film producers also now working very successfully in the television drama area. Um, and, you know, in general, it's enabled these companies to uh, expand their, their overall corporate activity, which underpins um, their sort of corporate strength, if you like. Now, we were asked to look at production flow and dig deeper into, you know, what's happening with the movement of productions. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there are no specific data on a consistent basis available to us. Um, we have looked at some published reports that in some countries that um, have been helpful. And the Netherlands in particular was interesting. Um, they closed their, in 2007, they closed their incentive um, system. The producers in the local market became very, very dependent on selective funding. There was a drop in production volumes. Suppliers of uh, facilities were moving abroad, including developing. Um, and, you know, when the, when the Belgian um, incentive uh, was improved and um, increased, that had a, an immediate impact also on what was happening. Um, there were also concerns about the efficiency and the transparency of the Dutch, Dutch tax shelter as well. Um, however, um, the, the one bit of good news is the broadcasters, as Andrew mentioned earlier, and the private sector investment has increased. Um, recently. Um, just moving on again to Czech Republic, um, in 2010 uh, Czech Republic introduced its own incentive, the Hungarian one had been around for a while, and it, it rebalanced the system. Um, again, one sort of single labour market, possibly a single market in other, in other aspects as well. Um, our research shows that the flow of production is predominantly into Europe, um, and this is particularly the case for France, Ireland, UK, also less so, but importantly, for Hungary and, and Czech Republic. Um, many of these are US originated productions, or other European, uh, well, US, European, unofficial productions. The UK obviously has, has shown great strength um, in terms of these international portable or inward investment films, over 70% of total production expenditure in 2013. Um, Ireland, for a similar figure, only 58% during that period of 2005 to 2011. And in France, foreign financing, as, it, as it's called, and we can talk later or we'll learn more about what that means, is at 20, nearly 22%. Um, but the, the CNC, in its report of last week, uh, identifies a number of positive impacts, including repatriating to France, French-based productions, French-initiated productions that were going elsewhere for more attractive um, opportunities. Okay. We've noticed that even if two countries next to each other aren't necessarily operating as a single-ish market, there are lots of um, new relationships emerging where countries that have never worked together are now doing so. And that can be very helpful for the smaller countries with the more, uh, the less mature um, sectors. And obviously, in addition to the economic benefits, there are substantial cultural, creative, and, and other benefits to that. But again, the data that we, we were able to gather does not reveal the full scale of, of, this, of this activity. Okay. The, that it's, it's true to say that in some countries where the um, incentives aren't working as smoothly as, as they should, um, there are adjustments that need to be made on a pretty consistent basis to what is on offer. I think France has been particularly strong um, in, in doing that. Right, going to pull to this together, and, and thank you for your patience, we've run over a bit. Um, in what do we conclude from all of this? And although I'll be repeating some things that we've been 
saying I think it's important to try and draw this together. Let's just put a little thing there. One of the major conclusions from this study is not something we were thinking we would um, come up with when we started, but that is um, a substantial inconsistency in amount, comparability, and quality of sheer data. Um, and I, I would say that um, the observatory has quite a challenge ahead of it to, um, to find ways to encourage um, the generation of, of the kind of data that we're talking about. And um, it's not just about levels of production, amounts of production, where it came from. I think if, if there was one you know, metric it would be great to be able to, um, to gather, it would be at any point in time to what degree is a country's capacity being utilised. Um, if incentives have a great effect on capacity utilisation, then it would be good to know the before and after, for example. Um, okay. The biggest finding, I think, from our study is this immediate impact on capacity utilisation. There are various examples of, of that um, that are shown there. I would say that the having um, an incentive structure that is, is planned in a way that sits alongside a strategy for um, facilities growth and infrastructure growth and crew growth is essential. And that's something we haven't um, seen that much of. The, the good news about an incentive once it is established, in most cases, if it's successful, it's known that it's successful and it gives confidence for years to come for um, further sector, for further investment in infrastructure, which, as I say, mostly comes from the uh, private sector. I mean, that 500 million um, euro, uh, pounds that I mentioned earlier all comes from the private sector and much of it from outside of Europe. Um, it takes longer <laughs> to, um, to build crew capacity. Um, and I would say that it's, it, this is one of the big challenges for nations that are thinking about an incentive. To what degree, at the same time as we're putting our incentive in place, should we be taking immediate action now to deal with um, increasing our crew capacity? And if, if it doesn't happen fast enough, which, you know, one would expect to be the case because it takes a while, then it, what tends to happen is cost advantages start to disappear and there is pressure on costs. Uh, it's, it's pure economics. Until that supply of crew catches up, we're going to have issues about, um, about net cost after the incentive. And in some cases, I'm guessing that that fact has caused the incentive to be improved while the, the crew, um, crew availability catches up. Um, I mentioned before issues um, and benefits about adjacent countries um, who are sort of, sort of acting together or the benefits come along together. It also um, helps countries, even though they're not adjacent, smaller countries around Europe who have this kind of support to, to, play, you know, to be involved in projects with, with the bigger countries in the whole co-production um, you know, co market. We talked about whether or not um, domestic productions are negatively affected by international portable productions coming in to displace them. There's no data that either proves or disproves this, although our consultations show that this should not be an issue. There are benefits for local um, production companies who are developing and producing national films. They can also get involved um, with some international um, projects. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that production volume will, will, will fluctuate in all the countries we study for a variety of reasons, um, and we all know what they are. One thing we can say finally, I could just go back to that, <laughs> is that the platform of sustained incentives, not jumping in and out, is a very important element in achieving all of the benefits that we've mentioned before. Okay, apologies for running over, but thank you very much.
uh, it was a Persian television and no worry, it will not be integrated in the next episode of War of Thrones. <laughs> Uh, now, um, the, the study has uh, demonstrated one of our major concerns of the observatory is the lack of data, the lack of harmonized data allowing to make uh, solid uh, comparison. In a sense, one of the slides that probably some of you were waiting is to have a general summary of what are the direct investment uh, or the, the direct funding uh, by um, countries and uh, the fiscal cost of fiscal incentives to have a, a general overview of what are uh, the, the film policy um, but uh, this is not possible and we have to, to recognize that the consultant are not in a position to collect uh, this, uh, all these figures to provide a, comprehensive overview because the data do not exist in a comparable Thank you, André. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I, I won't give you a comprehensive uh, introduction to the French tax-based in, uh, incentive system because it would be too long. But as André said, I'll, I'll focus on a, a recent study we've commissioned um, to know more about the impact, the economic and fiscal impact of our system of tax relief instruments on growth, jobs, and public finances. Um, and as a public body uh, responsible for uh, the implementation of public policies related to the cinema and audiovisual sector, we feel, of course, um, it is a duty for us to evaluate on a regular basis the efficiency of our aid schemes, whether they be direct um, aid schemes or tax-based incentive systems and I'm very grateful to uh, the Augsburg uh, team for the very comprehensive analysis you've done about the efficiency in your, the, this benchmark of, uh, of tax-based incentive systems in Europe. It's very important for us to know more about what um, neighboring countries are doing and we've now focused on what it's, what's the impact in France of our national system. Um, first of all, just to remind you about why we decided at the beginning of in 19, uh, not in 19, in 2003, to establish a tax-based uh, incentive system in France. Traditionally and historically, the CNC is more focused on direct aid um, schemes, whether they be automatic or uh, selective aid schemes. And there were two main reasons um, why we decided to implement um, tax relief systems. The first one was a growing international competition. And the second one was growing difficulties for producers to raise uh, private funding for, uh, for their projects, for their work because of shrinking uh, investments from uh, TV channels, for example, and shortage of capital for audiovisual production firms. So, there were two goals for, um, for um, us as a public uh, body. We wanted, you said repatriate, we wanted to uh, relocate production in France because we felt that there were um, a growing um, production flows out of France, uh, of French-based or French initiative project, and um, we wanted also, so we wanted to relocate um, production and we also wanted to attract foreign investors in France to produce uh, films or to shoot in France. So what were the goals? There were basically four goals for public authorities when they set up, when the parliament decided to set up tax relief systems. First of all, to encourage French and foreign production firms to shoot and keep the post-production work in France. Uh, develop the employment of technicians and workers. Promote French technical industries and research and development. And um, promote cultural diversity by um, supporting first directed films and access to uh, fragile work. I'm not sure this is the most recent uh, presentation, so I'll, I'll have to improvise then. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, these are slides that introduce you to the, to the French system. 
uh, of cinema tax incentive. So I won't get into detail, but if you have any questions, please feel free to to ask me. I'll, I'll tell you more about um, what are the threshold, the ceiling of the tax system, what are the beneficiaries, what what is the scope of eligible uh, production costs, uh, what are the types of production that are eligible to our tax system. As uh, the Altsburg team mentioned, we have four instruments. Um, we have one that is dedicated for video gaming, we have one that is dedicated, dedicated for foreign initiative films in order to attract shooting in France, and we have two uh, systems, one for the cinema, one for the uh, audiovisual sector, uh, in order to um, promote uh, production in France. Uh, for this presentation and for the presentation of the impact of our, our um, study, uh, I'll focus on two instruments, not the four of them. I'll focus on the uh, tax um, credit system for the cinema sector and the, so and the other one is the so-called TRIP, the tax rebate uh, for international production. That is a tax rebate for uh, international initiative films that are being shot in France. Um, how did we assess, this is some sort of a methodological approach, how did we assess the impact on uh, the French economy? We had mainly three to four criteria in order to assess the impact, the economic and fiscal impact on, of our uh, tax relief systems. First of all, the impact on uh, relocation of film. Second of all, the impact on jobs. Uh, third, uh, the impact on inward uh, investment, that is attracting foreign investment in France. And fourth, the impact on public finances. Um, as mentioned by the, uh, the Altsburg uh, study, uh, we feel that there were a positive impact on the relocation of film production in France. When the um, cinema tax incentive was created in 2003, 65% um, of uh, shooting days were shot in France for uh, French initiative or European uh, initiative films. Now it's about three quarters of shooting days. So there were a 10%, not a 10%, 10 point increase in the number of uh, shooting days in France since the implementation of the tax, uh, the, the, the tax incentive system for, for our national pr production. And there was a parallel drop in the number of shooting days abroad. Um, this is not a, a regular drop, as you can see. Um, there's overall uh, about eight, less than 800 days um, shot abroad that were diminished between two, uh, in, in about 10 years. But as you can see, um, the, there's, a, there's a variation uh, from year to year. And for example, there was a drop between 2003 when the CTI, when the our tax incentive system was created, from 2003 to 2006. Then there was an increase again till 2010. And then there was a, a relocation movement. We don't know if that's due to uh, our tax incentive system because, of course, there's, we have to take into account the impact of the economic crisis in Europe also. Um, what is also positive to notice is that we can say that there was a positive impact of our tax incentive system or tax-based incentive system on jobs as well as uh, economic activity in France. Um, so uh, positive impact on both jobs and a production level what is interesting to notice is that there was a, a more the, the impact on job is uh, bigger than on production and on production activity, which means that thanks to uh, our tax-based incentive system, we've been able to enrich economic growth with employment. That's very important in France, as you all know. Uh, there's an unemployment issue that is quite uh, big in France, so it's important to notice that. Um, public regulated instruments or public policy instruments can enrich economic growth with employment and jobs. So there was approximately about 40% increase in jobs in the audiovisual sector from uh, in, within 10 years and a 25% increase in uh, production. 
Now the trickiest part was to evaluate the impact for the state, for public finances. Um, and we had to calculate the impact, um, the positive impact, on public finances um, by taking into account employers as well as employee contribution to public finances. And they can be tax revenues or uh, social charges, social revenues. So we took into account um, employer contributions to uh, social security, um, income, ta income tax revenues generated by people employed in the audiovisual sector, uh, corporation tax revenue, and of course uh, VAT revenues. And the result is that for one euro of um, um, tax um, rebate or tax credit spent by the government, uh, there was approximately uh, less than 12 euros of expenses of activity in France in the cinema sector, and uh, the, 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 the state get back approximately more than three euros of tax and social revenues. So one, for one euro spent on a tax rebate system, the state gets at least three uh, euros of tax and social revenues. But these are uh, figures from uh, for, for 2013. Uh, now if I look at the second example, or the second illustration I wanted to um, give you, the tax rebate for international productions, so the, the tax rebate that aims at attracting foreign shooting in France it's for live action movies or even animated movies, so it's for both. Um, the result was that we, um, between 2009, when the, the tax uh, system for international production was um, uh, created, between 2009 and 2013, approximately 70, 70 to 72 works um, were being shot in France, and that amounted to uh, 365 million euros of expenses in France. Uh, who are the main beneficiaries? Uh, these are producers from the United States and the United Kingdom. You can see the figures uh, on the slides. They gather, uh, th those two countries uh, gather approximately three fourth, uh, three quarters of the, um, of the, the expenses and of the works that benefited from this uh, tax and credit system. And there were also three other, uh, 13 other countries uh, that benefited from it. Uh, this is quite important because, as you know, we um, are keen on promoting cultural diversity. So it's interesting for us to know that to notice that our system that aims at attracting foreign investment is not only aimed at Hollywood production or uh, Hollywood um, uh, initiatives. Uh, but there were also people from Turkey, from uh, China, Japan, Taiwan, Australia that benefited from this uh, system. And the impact on our main economic criteria, main economic uh, factors, whether it be jobs, activities, expenses in France or public finances are also positive from our point of view. Um, and as you can see, thanks to this TRIP um, initiative, thanks to this TRIP system, uh, we think, we estimate that the study that was commissioned um, estimates that approximately um, 11,500 um, jobs were created thanks to these expenses that were made in France and there were foreign initiative um, expenses and for the sole year of 2013 more than 350, uh, more than 3,500 jobs were, were created. The focus is now on animation feature film because we have a strong industry uh, that is quite attractive and that is also um, um, commissioned by uh, foreign companies to, to produce films for them. Um, and to sum it up, for one euro of trip, of, uh, for one euro spent by the French government to attract foreign shooting in France, um, we get approximately 7 uh, euro of expenses in the individual sectors, uh, sector which amounts to, in the end, uh, 2.7 euros of tax and social revenues for the state. And hadn't we have this 
trip system, we think most of these uh, foreign, foreign initiative productions would have been made elsewhere. So that's very important for the state to know that it's quite attractive. Um, I think I'm done. I won't get into too many details. Many thanks for your attention and I think the panel will go on. For example, uh, I guess it's, it's the only national film agency uh, keeping track of the number of deaths, uh, providing statistics for the number of deaths, which is in this context very important. Sonia, you are representing a country with a very recent uh, fiscal incentive system. Uh, we have seen uh, in the Osbeck presentation that 2013 was a very impressive year of, of development. Is uh, the trend continuing? Yeah, the trend is continuing. Uh, the trend is continuing. I'm just you know, going to put two numbers together. And that is basically, you know, we introduced it, you know, uh, the the Film Act was amended in 2011 and the scheme started in 2012. So there were nine productions in 2012 and 2013 combined. And the combined local spend for those two years was 11, 11 million. And only, you know, the announced spend for this year is 12.5 12 million. So you can see, like, it's, it's really upwards trend and uh, we are going to expect more because there's a word of mouth, there's a stability of the scheme, there are good experiences. We have also a benefit of one uh, really big, big and very important client, which is called Game of Thrones, which is continuing to come back to, to Croatia. They even filmed the second season for the first time in Croatia without tax incentives, but uh, the tax incentives being introduced had helped us to bring them back and to increase their uh, presence whilst they are filming. So from Dubrovnik, which was King's Landing, they're now going to split and you know this year for the season five it was even shipping. But our most of it that's our biggest client, as we do not have studio facilities, we do not attract like a big American productions. We've uh, concentrated on high end uh, television. Also, the dig that relocated from Jerusalem had to relocate from Jerusalem uh, came to film in Croatia. But it is mainly, I would say, like medium budget European productions and European co productions that, that are coming. And you know, sometimes those are the productions that combine selective, selective and um, automatic funding or tax incentive funding uh, in our own country. So yes, we can see, and as we are cash rebate, that also poses a bit of a problem. And that's, uh, for us, uh, it's very, very important to track the data, because it is the biggest tool that we have to explain to the politicians that you know, they should increase the reserved amount of funding. Uh, cash rebate schemes are very easy to introduce, because it is about political consensus. But also, uh, it is you know, you have a reserved part of money in the budget and you have to really keep track of what is, because Jonathan said that, you know, they have this inbuilt uh, weakness as they do not go through the, through the normal tax, tax system where the, the income is, you know, it, it's there. So it is why, why uh, this study is very important, that's why we get the data. And there's one really good thing in being a small country and everything goes through, through one one um, center, you know, one department, so we can, you know, monitor this. We also, of course, lack a bit of a data of what was before the introduction of the incentive scheme. Not so much about the selective funding, but about the television, television funding. Okay, thank you. Um, now, we will uh, have a comment from the representative of the professional organization. We are starting with Benoit. You are representing hundreds of producers. Uh, how do you perceive the, the world of fiscal incentive in Europe, but also outside of Europe? Well, thank you, Andre. Um, perhaps let me give you, you know, one general comment first. I think you know it's very important to highlight that uh, public support, and especially tax incentive programs, became increasingly essential and necessary uh, in this very special period of time for European film and perhaps TV sector. What I mean, actually, you know, is that um, we see that film producers in Europe are suffering 
as regard to private financing. Uh, in particular, the net decline of the of home entertainment window. And we saw actually, you know, that this home entertainment window was key in terms of pre-financing. Was also key regarding actually revenue streams, uh, regarding the exploitation of the works. And actually, basically, you know, the increase of online distribution windows at the moment did not manage to compensate the decline of in home entertainment windows. So just to say, you know, that um, tax incentive programs and other cultural funding um, have been actually, you know, a, a major um, of major support for our film sector in Europe. If you agree, I will say some words regarding what I heard uh, in part from Jonathan. Um, I think what is quite interesting is that this study or this presentation, Jonathan, at this stage, uh, seems to confirm uh, what we have been actually promoting uh, over the past years, including here in Brussels, is that tax incentive programs are instruments that contribute, that strongly contribute, to the structuring and the development of a film and TV sector in member states, obviously having decided to set this kind of, of instrument. Um, I could list, and I think you did it, and uh, the CNC did it, at least four areas um, where tax incentive programs have positive effects on jobs, on skills for local workforce, on development of infrastructures, infrastructures, my French is better than English, and obviously return of investment on jobs. Um, I, I would like you know just to echo what uh, what the CNC study says, and perhaps you know it was not exactly uh, the figures you know that were in the presentation, but it seems actually that the credit impôt. Um, between 2004 and 2012 has been a major factor actually contributing to an increase of employment of 38% as far as I remember. And it's quite obvious that um, it's, um, should I say, regretful that um, the pan-European study carried out a commission by the observatory could not be in a position actually you know, to provide figures at the European level. But the truth is that uh, all the studies have been reading, um, in particular outside Europe, uh, shows actually basically the same, you know, that the number of employees or jobs created by tax incentive programs are extremely impressive. Um, on return on investment for public authorities, so this is basically, you know, what, what, what is the amount generated when a state uh, gives one euro? Um, I think, you know, we had several, I went in you, into your, your study, but uh, I think, you know, um, <coughs> so the figures you gave us are perhaps focused on some categories and I think you aggregated all the, all the figures. As far as I understand, actually, basically, for one euro in France, when you consider all the existing tax incentive programs, the return on investment is 3.5 euros. Uh, as far as the cinema the, sector. Yeah, for the cinema sector. Um, I understand that what the CNC did is actually to focus on, uh, I say, revenues or spending um, generated with all suppliers of production company shooting in France. And my question, and perhaps it will be for uh, relate to um, did CNC somehow have been trying to assess the induced effect of tax incentive, in particular regarding promotion of countries of France, and impact on tourism. Uh, just obviously one example. When I say impact on tourism, that means impact you know, on hotel, impact on airlines, impact on um, well, uh, uh, cultural facilities, and so on and so on. Uh, just one, one example, and this is actually basically, you know, perhaps outside um, tax incentive programs, but actually proving 
the, the huge value of film actually regarding tourism. Uh, the Stockholm business region uh, made a study two years ago, as far as I remember, regarding what was the expected impact of having the girl with a dragon tattoo. That was basically one of the of the book of the book of Millennium series, um, which had actually two cinematographic adaptations. One in Sweden, I mean, one from Sweden, one from the U.S. Both of these films were shot in Stockholm. And actually, you know, the expected increase in terms of tourism was between three and four percent additional tourists for Stockholm, with an additional revenues of 50 million euros. So just a way to say that when we are observing, assessing tax incentives, it's obviously important to be in a position to assess the induced positive effect of these tax incentive programs for the economy and local, the local economy. I will go very fast. Uh, the other, the other you know, impact also to the development of uh, infrastructure and increased skills for workforce. I just would like to point out what you said, Jonathan, um, regarding the fact that um, you, you have been focusing on the fact you know, that when um, the, the film, when there are some productions from outside Europe, shoot in some member states in Europe, there is actually an advantage also for local independent producers. And it was, I think, and this is actually how uh, uh, my members in Europe are perceiving actually, you know, the, the trend. It's very important to highlight, you know, that indeed there are some uh, gain from overall sector and fashion improvement. There are obviously, you know, interests regarding the fact that you have, you know, an increased skill uh, workforce locally. Um, I could also say that this has also other benefits, not only for film and TV sector, but also for all national creative industries. Because, uh, there, there, you know, one technician could be working on, on set of a film, but could tomorrow work you know, in theatres and so on. Just to tell you that this is clearly structuring the economy, and this is structuring in, in instruments. Perhaps of interest that to say that uh, the study could, I don't know what will be in, but could recall which projects are eligible under which tax incentive programs. Because the presentation could give the impression that only non European uh, uh, production are eligible <coughs> for the tax incentive program. It is not true. Actually, you know, it's accessible to non European in most of the places. European, I mean European and national, and also the domestic productions in most of the cases, perhaps except for three in, in France. Last word, um, just to, to stress what you already said, Jonathan. Uh, the presentation, your presentation, recalls um, all the elements contributing to the final decision from the producer regarding where the film will be shot. And indeed, actually, you know, there are a myriad of elements. Availability of financial instruments like tax incentive is just, and I want to stress just one of them. One of the elements uh, of importance, if not the most crucial one, is creative elements that are forming part, actually, of the decision-making regarding where we're going to shoot. Some stories, some artistic decisions uh, are those, actually, you know, making the decision regarding where we will be shooting. And actually, just to come back to the girl with a dragon tattoo, Stockholm was an actor, basically, of this field. And this is a perfect example that for some and many, I would say, Films. The place where you will be shooting will be crucial in the decision making process, including obviously the availability of skilled staff, obviously. And as a last word, it is perhaps best of interest now to, 
to highlight that there are many projects um, shoot in the country of origin of the production and the director and, and all the, the creative contributors. Because actually shooting outside uh, its country of origin generates several constraint, constraints. Um, for instance, it requires extra administration, uh, more pre-production activities. Um, and other elements obviously are of importance. Um, you can imagine that when you are shooting outside the country, well, the language concept will be obviously essential. And you know that you will have to deal with a vast variety of languages when you are shooting outside. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit, for this uh, variety of, of comments. Um, a question to uh, Pauline. You are representing the directors, and I suppose that the directors are uh, supporting the producer in uh, uh, any kind of support to film policy who could improve the, the financial economic situation of the industry. But what about the perception of the impact on the creation itself? Uh, well, yes, of course, well, from a film director's point of view, um, fiscal incentives in general are a very positive thing. There is no, no, no question about that. But uh, beyond the uh, economic and, and social impact of those schemes, um, our main criteria to evaluate them is actually their cultural impact on, on audiovisual creation, obviously. So we consider that, of course, by attracting uh, well, non-EU productions and, uh, and co-productions throughout Europe. The schemes, of course, provide very important things for, for a film director. They provide infrastructure, employment, um, a high degree of professionalism uh, throughout Europe. And um, that's, that's, of course, very important for them to have a, a good professional context to actually uh, do their job. That's why some of our members are very keen on, on proposing to the governments to actually get those tax incentives and, and uh, going to in the countries in Slovenia or in Cyprus, for example. Uh, we also consider that uh, those incentives to production uh, foster a kind of a creative collaboration uh, between, between directors and their crews and their screenwriters, which is uh, very important things for them because um, it actually it actually touches to what they consider Europe should be a place of, of creative collaboration and you know thriving creation that is not only focused on, on their national um, situation and of course in a context in a political context context of a national retrenchments that sometimes is very obvious to everyone it's it's something that really matches to them uh, but we also consider that those incentives must foster, obviously, European creativity, because that's kind of their core activity. Um, and, and I think everyone can agree that outsourcing creation would be very, very damaging for, um, for the cultural identity, both locally and, and the European cultural identity itself. So, of course, this increase of investment for audiovisual works nationally is a very important factor that we welcome. And uh, the, the main thing in all this that we are very careful about is that we do not want to get in a situation when we have a kind of a stand, standardization of the creative process where those uh, investments, wherever they come from, would lead us to write always the same stories because that's what uh, those new investors will be more interested in. What we want is that those incentives actually uh, will shower money on all kinds of film, a diversity of films so that you know authors uh, can actually be born locally, grow locally and then reach out to the world from, from, from that uh, careful environment that has been built for them. So in a nutshell, um, we think that uh, fiscal incentives, whatever shape or form they have, must be part of a comprehensive and consistent audiovisual policy, both at national and European level. Thank you. Now it's not the point of view of the workers. We have seen that there are some data showing positive impact on employment from the statistical point of view. Even if we do not have all the statistics necessary, but what exists 
for positive impact, but uh, statistics is not everything. No, statistics are not. Uh, it's not everything, but. Uh, um, I would I would like to um, to continue where uh, Pauline has uh, ended and underlined this, and I think the study um, um, showed this um, in, in, in the summary. Fiscal incentives are very important. Uh, sometimes they're even a determining uh, factor, uh, but they won't do the job alone. You need uh, to have certainty uh, of investment for the long run. Uh, to uh, invest in infrastructure, into skills, into job development, um, also have um, the certainty for the producers and uh, for the investors that there is a holistic industry approach in a given country and indeed in Europe in general. Um, and that is the basis. So um, I don't think we can make a link immediately between fiscal incentives and, um, and job growth, although um, um, Job growth that definitely benefits from the fiscal incentives. Let's put it. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, second thing I want to say is that <clears throat> when we talk about jobs and the growth of jobs, um, we need to underline that we are operating in a very fragile labor market, which is um, characterized, um, as the study, uh, the presentation has shown this morning, by a high level of mobility, which is beneficial to. Uh, to cultural diversity and the exchange and the cultural <laughs> collaboration, um, but also puts um, the people working on set and in uh, post and pre-production in uh, high demand on, on their availability in different places. Um, <clears throat> uh, second, um, the fragility is also expressed through that it's uh, not permanent jobs. So when you, when statistics, and here we come back to statistics, when you say, oh, we have such much more growth in jobs, actually the question I would then ask the uh, researcher is, do you mean uh, equivalent of full-time employment jobs, or did you count how many more people were working throughout uh, the year on different uh, productions? Um, I mean, that is a very important qualifying um, thing I want to say, but it doesn't take away from um, the fact that fiscal incentives are a very important tool, but only one tool in the mix, and we cannot um, um, underline enough, also being here in Brussels and being aware that um, people who look at state aid with uh, legitimately very critical eyes here, but to remind those people that uh, it is not about one measure. It's the mix of measures, and um, to have a successful national and European film industry, uh, you need to be uh, very careful in how you adjust and make those uh, mix, the mix uh, of those uh, tools more efficient in the future. Uh, we have 10 minutes, uh, and I would suggest maybe to ask the people in the public if there are any questions. To or consultants or to our panelists. Could you introduce yourself, please? Good afternoon. Uh, by, by now, my name is Hans Block, and uh, I'm from Amsterdam. Uh, uh, I'm very interested to uh, hear all the analysis and the figures. Uh, to supporting more support from the local governments into the film industry. Uh, what I haven't heard was the effect on uh, European co-production. Uh, is there maybe anyone in the panel who could give any idea whether that is on the increase or whether that's becoming more difficult because each country is fighting for its own share in, in, of, of the of pie? Uh, and, and, uh, I, I would personally my own experience in the film industry, uh, the European co-productions, in my opinion, uh, is, is a perfect vehicle to increase the, 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 the qualitative aspects of European cinema. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. I think I'll, <laughs> Can you hear me? I think I'll, um, I'll answer that. Uh, as gracious uh, representative in your image, we just uh, celebrated 25th anniversary. So, uh, 
we think, and you know, as I can see, I've been in Euromash for the last six years and seeing the, seeing the numbers, the productions coming and the structure of financing, I think that the tax incentives are only helping because they open yet another another line of financing and you know you can get to the to the level of the financing you for example need to go to Euromash. So I don't think that it has adverse effect. I think that it contributes to collaboration in between in between European countries, in between producers, because producers and creative you know, directors, they are the ones, you know, we are talking about the countries, but it is creative creative people who are co-productions uh, in Europe. And uh, to come back to Croatia, as I, you know, maybe mentioned, like, you know, yes, one big client, yes, it's HBO, but, you know, Game of Thrones is mainly European-based uh, production, even the production company is based in the UK. But most of our incentives went to European co-production, either, you know, unofficial co-productions or official co-productions. So, you know, that, that's something that, you know, we were really keen to keep and not so much in go after like a big American investors because I think you know we're a small country, we have to use our comparative benefits and there are other, you know, we can't compete on a certain level with, with big players in the field. But you know we can find our corner and European co productions. And we've also increased and there is a combination, we've increased our selective funding for co productions. So it's gone up, so it's a really healthy combination. And you know, of course, I'm always preaching about productions in European countries. So if, if I'm correct, in most of the country, it's possible to, to mix uh, fiscal incentives and uh, direct funding and corporate Yeah, there, there, are, there are no constraints. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, answering your question, there's definite evidence that the introduction of an incentive or an enhancement has a beneficial effect on co productions, mostly again from conversations with people because the one would have to do is analyze the data on the amounts of financing coming from each country um, for every film that is a co-production to make sure that we understand the impact of the selective funding and of the automatic funding. Just one, uh, figures vary from year to, uh, to year. Um, we, in France, we produce approximately 270 uh, feature films per year, approximately 30%, so almost a third of them are co-produced with other countries, whether they be, uh, most of them are European countries, of course, and neighboring countries, and others are, are, are uh, non-European countries. Is that on the increase, or is that...? No, no, it's been uh, almost equivalent. Um, what I, but I wanted to mention one figure because we saw the, the increase of uh, um, investment inflows in Belgium. Um, we've got 30 uh, co-productions between France and Belgium per year and of course the tax incentive system in Belgium has helped reach the level of uh, French-Belgium um, co-productions to that level because Belgium is now our first uh, co-production partner, not only because of the language affinity but also because of the tax credit system. And I would agree with all um, uh, the members of the panel, selective aid schemes are key to promoting truly artistic co-productions, which is our aim today. To the amount of uh, what is, uh, sorry, uh, said by the um, uh, cinema communication, you know that we can have uh, uh, higher, a slightly higher aid intensity for co-productions so that um, producers can gather more public funding for when they co-produce. Thank you. My name is Lena Laksman and I also want to thank you for this seminar. But I have one question. I really feel uh, like a novice in this, uh, with this matter. But uh, what is not clear for me is that uh, are all these different kind of incentive schemes, are they automatic or not? Because as far as I kind of understood, tax credit uh, uh, is automatic. But what about, what, what about rebate and tax shelter? Is it also automatic? That's something I'd like to know. Thank you. 
Okay, the, the rebate is, the rebate and the tax credits are kind of automatic in as much as there's a set um, number of criteria and measures to determine what expenditure, production expenditure qualifies. And um, if you're a producer planning to go to a country to uh, make use of the rebate or the tax credit, and you plan your expenditure in, in accordance with the rules, you will know before you start spending that money exactly the amount of rebate that you will get back. The tax shelter is also um, relatively automatic, but there are many more steps that you have to put in place in order to um, access it, including if you're a producer, working with another entity, a firm of specialist financiers, who need to raise the money from the investors. Now there may be some uh, of these uh, companies, these investment organizers, if you like, that already have access to a pool of investors so that a producer's conversation with them, you can be pretty confident as a producer that you are going to get um, the investment coming in. Uh, but it's not, quite, it's not quite the same because there will be probably competing projects that are going for the same amount of investment money. So the, the tax credit and rebate structures are much more certain and much more um, transparent. What I would say is an element of uncertainty with rebates or tax credits is if there is a cap on the amount of available for the structure for the system in every year. If there's a cap every year, then what tends to happen is producers are encouraged to put in their applications early during the year, sometimes when they don't actually have everything together. And an application can go in in some countries, can be preliminarily approved, but then when it comes to actually deciding is this going to happen or not, if the project doesn't happen, then, that, then the system gets confused, if you like. Um, so the, the existence of a cap, um, I understand politically why it might be there in some countries, um, actually can be quite a harmful um, impediment to a smooth and efficient operating of a system. And then uh, the SOFICA system in France is a selective dimension. Most of our tax-based incentive systems are um, automatic, but we have two. The, the one dedicated to video gaming, <laughs> Uh, because there's a cultural test for it, and um, and the Sofica system, which is some sort of a tax shelter system uh, that channels private um, investment in films in return for um, um, uh, tax rebate on um, income tax and the income tax. Um, those uh, the the. The financial instruments that are set up by um, corporations that are incorporated in France, they have to meet certain criteria in order to have access to the tax, uh, to the SOFICA system, tax rebate system. And these criteria are that they have to have a certain amount of investment in low budget films or first to second uh, feature films. Um, in, they have to invest almost all of their um, money in independent or independently produced films. So these are the so-called cultural diversity uh, criteria. Uh, that's, that's exactly one of the main things that we're very concerned about because I'm sure everybody is aware of the situation that arose in, in French-speaking Belgium with the tax shelter and some of this, uh, those effects that they had to focus on, on big commercial commercial productions, which actually had our a Belgian member be, be very forceful about the fact that reform was needed alongside uh, the whole industry. Okay. We are maybe, it's maybe now time to discuss on uh, the adverse effects of uh, tax shelter or fiscal incentives in general. We have a general impression that it's positive, but there are some, some risks. In many cases, there is no precise evaluation year after year. So, um, first, it's very difficult actually you know, to anticipate um, what will be the effect of tax incentive next year. I think you know, some countries are you not know, implemented. 
some tax incentive uh, initiative with friends with Sofika and some others, I said be able now to identify what could be the effects of such instruments. This is basically the same regarding all the kinds of public support, including for training, uh, including for support of uh, script writing and so on. So, just a way to say that you have to wait some years before being in a position to identify. I would like to say one word because um, Jonathan actually uh, emphasized uh, what has been happening in some countries. From our post point of view, actually, um, tax incentives are a kind of QR uh, instrument. Uh, obviously, cultural instruments, but having a very strong economic purpose. At the same time, you know, these instruments are coexisting with, um, let's say, cultural funding. This is actually basically selective and automatic, which goal is to be in a position for the states to have uh, a local cinematography able to speak about what's going on in the country with uh, local languages and so on. I would like to highlight, you know, that obviously there is a risk if some member states uh, or countries were actually at some point considering to, to say, well, we have to put a top priority on tax incentive and forget cultural funding. Because basically it works because they are both, and not only one. So I just want to highlight and to recall uh, the value that this is a strategy for film and television sectors. That's something you could have asked. And it was basically actually, you know, inside the presentation we saw, uh, we have to anticipate the future needs. Uh, 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 Johannes said so. Uh, we have to anticipate, states have to anticipate what would be the needs in terms of employees. How can we set up uh, uh, training and so on, and so on, and so on? That's the same regarding infrastructures. We are talking about studios, but we can also talk about promotion agency. We can also talk about um, several other categories. Actually, you know, this is well, this is a strategy. And if you fail to have this strategy, at some point there will be some adverse effect. But not perhaps only on tax incentive programs, but because some thoughts have not been considered by public authorities, but also by private sector. I would like to say that the responsibility is only on member states. Hey, Jonathan, uh, I think it will be the, the last word of the, the conclusion. Uh, what is your, your, your view on this point and uh, with all the interview you made with all the, uh, the literature you went through, uh, do you think that member states are working enough to prevent this uh, adverse effects? And what, you, what would be your recommendations? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think, first of all, adverse effects. Um, yes, if, the, if this kind of fiscal incentive is not part of a holistic, strategic, all of sector strategy in a country, um, that anticipates what the effects of the incentive might be, that helps the incentive, you know, leverage other kind of support. So, on their own, not, not particularly helpful. And indeed, um, we've had situations, um, and this takes me to my second point, which is predictability. Um, we've had situations, like in the UK in 2006, where the tax shelter incentive was probably not fully understood by the government at the time, where there were some significant adverse um, effects because it was bad in structure. And the government, to the shock and surprise of anybody, closed the door and stopped it immediately. That was disastrous. So for an incentive such as this to be a success, it A, has to be part of a holistic strategy, and B, it has to be you know, predictable, reliable, consistent, and to give everyone the confidence that, that it's there. But you asked me, you know, what, what can be done to, um, to deal with any adverse effects. And I, I honestly don't think that there are that many adverse effects, and I did touch on a, f a few of them. Um, and I, I sort of go back to a point you made very earlier, and, that, and that's about transparency. So 
that about um, having, in all the countries in Europe that have incentives, a consistent, um, comparable way of gathering data about the, that and about the effect of, of incentives and what's going on with incentives. So it will become much easier in the future to do a, the kind of study that we did. Um, that's quite a challenge, obviously, um, and I would suggest baby steps first, but um, that, would be, um, that would be the solution to dealing with any perceived problems. Okay, thank you. I think it's uh, time to, to conclude the Sudan. Okay. <laughs> so I, first, I want to thank all of you for having come, for having stayed, for having participated. A uh, special thank to our panelists and to our consultants. <laughs> And I want to pick up on last word from Benoit. He was talking about anticipating needs and strategies. Now, we anticipated the need that you might want to continue to discuss among yourself and that you will be very hungry at this point in time. And our strategy, therefore, is to invite you to a little finger food, so with cutlery, I hope, and please continue to enjoy this event and thanks again for having me with us. Yeah.